Hi, I'm Brianna Gray, and I'm here with Glenn Greenwald and Sam Biddle uh, to talk about the recent controversy surrounding uh, many social media platforms' choice to exclude Alex Jones. Alex Jones is a well-known shock jock uh, who is known for, um, for example, claiming that the Sandy uh, Hook shootings were fake. But it took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake for making antagonistic statements about trans people, um, for making statements that amount to direct attack on their personhood and their safety as individuals. Uh, recently, Facebook and other platforms have decided that they, uh, he is in violation of their hate speech policies and anti-bullying policies and banned him from the site. This has triggered some controversy on the right because they perceive this rule to be um, inequitably applied. Um, and so you're here today to decide what the responsibility of these platforms should be to um, monitoring this kind of behavior and what kind of speech protections, if any, we want to exist in these kinds of contexts. Um, so I'll start with you, Sam. Do you think that he should have been banned? I do. Uh, I think it's overdue. Alex Jones has been doing this for something like 20 years. This is not a recent thing. Uh, I think that in the past we've associated Infowars, his uh, media platform, uh, more with sort of laughable conspiracy theories. You know, lizards are running the government. Uh, you know, 9-11 was, you know, caused by magnetic waves. It's like really crazy out there stuff that's pretty easy to shrug off because it's so silly. Um, in recent years, especially around uh, the, the rise of Trump and Trumpism, uh, it's gotten, there's been a shift. Uh, it's, there's been a shift to promoting conspiracy theories that actually have real world consequences. Uh, it, it, it's, there's no constituency of lizard people who are gonna be upset <laughs> about th that stuff in the past, but when you uh, share to millions of followers the claim that, uh, and not just share, but push the claim that uh, Sandy, the Sandy Hook massacre was a government false flag. Uh, that, I think, is substantially different than uh, the sort of sillier stuff. Um, and it's, it's dangerous. Uh, I think it has uh, real world danger. Uh, it has real world victims. The parents of uh, the, these murdered children were singled out by not just Infowars, but its millions of pretty uh, often unhinged and, and uh, uh, vociferous fans and followers and uh, targeted, harassed, threatened, uh, made to feel like they were in danger in their own homes because they have now been implicated in this uh, uh, picture, this conspiratorial picture of a government cover-up, a plot to take away guns and you know, uh, destroy the Second Amendment. Um, and and you know, like I said, it causes real world harm. So what's interesting is that you started out with the kind of truthiness question, but that's not the grounds on which he was excluded, right? The, he was excluded on the basis of violating um, anti-bullying policy um, and hate speech policy. So I want to turn um, to you, Glenn, and ask you what your thoughts on that, the choice to exclude on those grounds are. So I think if we frame the discussion as should Alex Jones be banned, um, we're doing somewhat of a disservice to the discussion it reminds me a little bit of trying to say talk about the taboo on torture by asking whether if we know for certain that someone has planted a nuclear device in a major city that's scheduled to detonate in 40 minutes and kill the live you know and the lives of two million people and the only way we can find out where it is is if we torture them should we do it um, it's going to create a lot of divisions and emotions in people um, that's going to distract from what the real substantive questions are in the torture debate about whether or not we should maintain a taboo on it. And I look at focusing on Alex Jones similarly because he's such a grotesque figure, um, such a singularly menacing uh, person for the reasons Sam correctly described that I think it obscures rather than illuminates what we need to be asking, which is do we want to have a free internet where people are unconstrained in their ability to express themselves and to speak out without having state or corporate authorities sitting in the dark making unaccountable decisions about what is and is not allowed to be heard on the internet? Um, or do we want to empower entities that 
a lot of us, including people involved in this discussion, have long been arguing are pretty pernicious, namely Silicon Valley executives like Mark Zuckerberg or Eric Schmidt at Google, or the current government of the United States led by, in terms of the Justice Department, Jeff Sessions. Do we want to empower institutions like that to make decisions for us about what is true and what is false, what ideas are um, allowed and what ideas are, are too dangerous? Of course there are dangers from having somebody like Alex Jones have a platform. There's always been dangers to free speech in that ideas that are actually pernicious and destructive can be aired in a way that other people hear them. But there are also severe dangers to creating a framework because we're so fixated on our emotional views about Alex Jones, where not just states, which at least have democratic accountability, but corporate titans that exert incredible power utterly insulated from democratic accountability over what was supposed to be the, one of the most important innovations in human history, the internet, because of the way it would allow free dialogue to empower them to start making choices for us about what is true and what isn't true, about what ideas are acceptable and what ideas aren't acceptable. And I think the real question is, do the dangers from allowing people like Alex Jones to speak freely outweigh the dangers of taking the internet and putting it in the hands of a tiny number of extremely powerful billionaires and not just allowing them, but begging them to make decisions about what we can and can't hear over the internet. And I find the latter framework to be very alarming. So I think a counter argument that a lot of people would have to that is that this isn't about the internet as a whole. This is about certain discrete platforms, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, that have their own internal sets of rules and that as private institutions um, should be allowed to decide who is and who isn't on the site. And what I think is interesting is that you spoke of um, corporate and government kind of in tandem, um, kind of understanding the fact that we live in a world now where these private institutions have at least as much um, you know, public importance as the kind of public forms that were contemplated when First Amendment law was being established. After reviewing some of the policies in preparation for this, it became clear to me that they had clearly been looking to free speech case law to craft these policies. And a lot of what they have decided to ban are actually very similar to the same things that are banned under First Amendment law. So if we look at their hate speech policy, what they def how they characterize hate speech um, as attacking people basically based on um, characteristics that we associate with protected classes, race, ethnicity, national origin, religious affiliation, disability, um, with violent or dehumanizing speech. This feels kind of right to me. That feels at least familiar. Um, and so I wonder if uh, as a on the first instance you have an issue with the policies as stated and if not, whether you think that there's an ability to rehabilitate those policies or that it shouldn't be in the hands of Silicon Valley at all. I'll turn to you, Sam. So <clears throat> if we're talking about the internet as a whole, the, you know, capital I internet, do I think that you should be allowed, in, in a, a great sense of that word, to be a racist, to be a liar, to be a bigot on the internet. I don't think that you should be imprisoned. I, I don't think that you should be uh, uh, barred from writing a racist blog post, you know, uh, uh, I, I think that it's okay if you're marginalized as a result of that. I mean, look, anyone right now, as of today, can go to a library, can go to any computer in the world, well, most computers in the world, <laughs> download a free browser, type in infowars.com, and infowars will come up. They can read it as much as they want. They can uh, believe any of it. They can share it. They can email it. Alex Jones and Infowars have not been silenced. T to get to your question about uh, uh, the policy, uh, about the policies themselves, I mean, I he, here's where I actually start to agree with Glenn in, in a pretty meaningful way, which is that I don't think that any company should be in a position to set policies for two billion people. I mean, here I'm talking about Facebook. There should not be a company that has that degree of power, and it's a failure of, of regulatory bodies uh, in the United States and elsewhere that Facebook has been permitted to grow 
to this level where we're even having this conversation. So that's a really, that's an interesting take to me because I understand the fear that comes with such a concentration of people and the power of having um, so much influence over so, so many people. But in the context of a platform that's all about communication, I feel a little bit more sympathy to the idea that the, it should be allowed to be big than I would if this were a different kind of corporation where my um, kind of antitrust instincts would kick in. I mean, Glenn, is, is that your objection to this as well, or is it rooted in something else? Well, I mean, I, you know, it's, it is so interesting, this, this recent debate, because it is, has kind of scrambled ideological assumptions in, in ways that I think are, are kind of revealing. I mean, there is now a pretty vibrant left-wing movement among the people in kind of left-wing think tanks and academic circles who work on these issues and certainly a political movement, a viable political movement in Europe to start to look at Google and Facebook in particular as something other than just ordinary private companies, but as something really more resembling nation states or at least the kind of massive companies that became too large for us to tolerate in terms of a democratic society like Standard Oil or AT&T that were broken up under antitrust laws. Sam is right that Alex Jones hasn't been banned from the entire internet. But imagine, you know, say in the 1940s, um, if AT&T adopted a policy where they said, we're not gonna allow our phone lines to be used by people who are known activists in left-wing circles because we don't want our technology being exploited for spreading communist ideology that we find extremely pernicious. And people like me would stand up and say, we don't want AT&T executives determining who can and can't speak to one another and what ideas can and can't be communicated. And then someone might stand up and say, look, they're not banned from communication. They just can't use a telephone. They can drive six hours and go talk to the person directly. Um, or the same with the person who had a monopoly over telegraphs at the turn of the century. The reality is that Facebook and Google, I think, are becoming something much different than public companies. They do a lot more than just fostering communication. Um, in fact, their primary business at this point is not fostering communication or allowing internet searches. In the case of Google, it's gathering data about all of us so that they can sell this data and monetize it. And their main business actually is artificial intelligence, is understanding how the human brain works so that they can replicate it and even build a better version. These are companies with incredible power over almost every aspect of our civic life. Um, and so I'm not losing any sleep over the fact that Alex Jones' videos can't be on YouTube, um, but I am starting to lose some sleep over the ability of these corporations to exercise unconstrained control over almost every facet of human life um, in a way that I do think starts to transcend, transcend the power even of the most powerful governments. And that I think is what this Alex Jones banning is about. And let me just make one last point about Facebook, which is it isn't like this is the first time that they've decided to ban big platforms in the name of eliminating incitement to violence or hate speech. We wrote an article actually at the end of last year about how they're now taking requests, not just from the US government, but from the Israeli government. And I think in something like 97% of the cases have taken requests from the Israeli government to delete pages of Palestinians, including Palestinian journalists and media outlets and activists, and have just deleted them on the same grounds that they just deleted Alex Jones, which is these pages are hate speech, they incite violence, and I think that there's this kind of romanticized notion that if we have the rules that Brianna read earlier, that they're gonna be implemented in this way that's really pleasing to the liberal mind. And I think the reality is much different that powerful corporations are gonna institute censorship rules in general, not to protect the marginalized against the powerful, but to protect the powerful against the marginalized. I don't have any, uh, uh, any, any delusions that this is Facebook um, looking out for anyone other than Facebook and its share price. I think that this was a conservative response to public outcry and public anger. I don't think that Facebook has any interest in protecting uh, marginalized people or vulnerable people. I think that this was mostly a PR play, hoping that the Alex Jones thing would go away. So in that sense, they, they don't have a lot of credibility when it comes to 
uh, enforcing these rules. They enforce them very unevenly. Uh, and that just goes back to my point that there ought not to be maybe a company that has this power. This idea that, we're, that we can kind of um, get out of this by breaking up Facebook or somehow get, you know, getting rid of these platforms. The, the power of Facebook is that I can connect with my friend from international school in Kenya and that all these billions of people across the world are in this one platform with one login and we can all share this community. And if this were, um, you know, America only has you know, 300 million people and not 2 billion people, but it's still quite a few. And we've, you know, we have decided that our public squares um, are properly governed by a set of rules and constitutional protections that by and large we feel kind of comfortable with. Are we really throwing up our hands and saying there's no way that we can drill down on what a set of rules could be that actually would give people sufficient protections that we feel comfortable that the rule cannot be abused basically to promote certain kinds of um, ideologies. I think it's impossible. I think that there's no way you can draft rules for two billion people that will be equitable and that will make everyone happy. But what about 300 million? 300 million, yeah, if, if, let's say if there were a, something called uh, Facebook USA or mm -hmm. you know, like AOL, you know, and it was a, a domestic product that was maybe interoperable with other uh, websites around the world. I think that'd be a lot more manageable. I think that splitting Facebook up into more manageable chunks uh, where you don't have to write rules for a, a significant fraction of the entire Earth's population could be a path forward. So there's already, though, this way in which there's different rules depending on where you are in the world using the internet, right? Facebook China has different access uh, you know, allotments than Facebook USA. Are we saying that, oh yes, uh, Mark Zuckerberg should kowtow to whatever Russia or China or you know, Saudi Arabia's sense of what free speech rights should be. I mean, what do you think about that, Glenn? Well, for, I mean, first of all, I think the point you raised about breaking up Facebook is a, a really excellent one. Um, I think generally when people talk about breaking up tech giants, they're talking more about, or at least they should be talking more about things like breaking up Google, which currently has eight different products that each have more than a billion users. So that's the kind of vertical integration that can be really threatening to just a free internet generally. So you could break up Google into the eight different into eight different companies like we did with AT&T, like we did with Standard Oil. Um, but you're right, Facebook, one of the beauties of the internet, right, is this international in interconnectivity of it. We don't have inter insulated, nationalized internet. And that's one of the most important parts, I think, of this innovation is that's how we were able to understand and follow the Arab Spring. It's how it's fostered communication between people who never otherwise would be able to communicate, how we've been able to see video in Gaza of what the Israeli military actually does as opposed to the propaganda to which we've been subjected for decades. These are critical things that we don't want to start tinkering with. So I think that what's really interesting here though is that for a long time, Silicon Valley didn't want this power. It's not like this is Facebook and Google trying to act as censors. It's a really fascinating dynamic. For a long time, their view was, we're not media companies. We're not gonna edit or curate the content that is carried over on our platforms. We're just platform providers. We're like AT&T. AT&T doesn't make decisions about what ideas can be communicated over the phone line. You can pick up the phone line of AT&T and call a friend and spew the most rancid ideology and try and spread it and organize it and they're not gonna stop because they're a neutral, content neutral platform. That's what actually Facebook and Google and Twitter have wanted to be. And it's really kind of been the public that has imposed upon them, demanded that they become censors and arbiters of truth and falsity. Um, you know, and Mark Zuckerberg in that interview we did with Kara Swisher got a, a lot of mockery for saying, I shouldn't be the one deciding whether things like Holocaust denial or anything else um, is objectively true or false. I'm, I'm just Mark Zuckerberg. I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a set of people who uh, deny that the Holocaust happened. Yes, right? I find that deeply offensive. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I, I don't believe that our platform should take that down because I think that there are things that different people get wrong. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg doing that either. It's the public that has demanded that. And Sam is right, of course, that Facebook's motives in taking off Alex Jones from its pages like Apple did and other companies wasn't 
benevolently motivated. It was motivated because of public pressure. But does anyone think the public pressure is going to stop here? Of course, we're going to now have a public campaign on the part of the right to remove Antifa pages or Black Lives Matter pages. Um, you know, my history as a First Amendment lawyer is steeped in the 60s and 70s when the hate speech of that time was the NAACP who were constantly accused of inciting violence on the part of its members to enforce boycotts of white owned stores because its leaders would give fiery speeches and then get sued or prosecuted by state officials. And the argument was you can't hold people responsible in a society that has free speech for provoking other people into action. Um, and I think we're going down this road where Alex Jones is only the first of the examples and by no means the last of where Facebook and Google uh, capitulate to public pressure to pull pages. They're already doing it in parts of the world like Israel and Palestine in a way that I think most people on the left would find highly disturbing. So what's interesting is that it's not just these media platforms, right? Uh, we saw in the wake of the Charlottesville protests last year that there were people um, who were calling for the ACLU to no longer do what it's done for a really long time and represent people's uh, First Amendment issues on a kind of value neutral way. So when they decided to um, take on the case of some of the Charlottesville protesters last year, we had, I believe, uh, Casey Park write an article in the New York Times arguing that the ACLU um, shouldn't do that anymore and people were calling for the ACLU to be defunded. And to me that represents a huge shift that is genuinely frightening to me um, because people in, in Trump's America seem to have lost the sense that these kind of um, lenient, like more, the, 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 the emphasis on more uh, kind of um, open speech at the end of the day protects the most vulnerable people more arguably than these kind of rabble rousers like Alex Jones. And to say in Trump's America that I'm willing to give up that like kind of last constitutional protection for the vulnerable to say and do what we please um, seems to be really short-sighted and naive. I think it's really interesting to bring up the ACLU and Charlottesville because now we're talking about something that happened offline, right? That yeah. wasn't a, a Facebook protest. It, it didn't happen on Facebook's platform. It happened in, in the real world, in reality, in the physical space. Um, and there the ACLU is defending uh, a sort of speech on the absolute fringe of society. Should a, a universally despised group, you know, more or less universally despised group of, of white supremacists be allowed to rally in a public space in a city? I think that is a different question than can Alex Jones get a free massive distribution platform? To me, I actually think the First Amendment as the jurisprudence has evolved over the 20th century in large part with the help of the ACLU and lots of liberal and left-wing justices who have been very aggressively protective of First Amendment uh, prerogatives, even of people with hideous views, including Nazis and white supremacists, um, is a pretty good framework. Um, and to me, at least, the framework is that there are no political ideas too harmful or dangerous or threatening or pernicious or offensive that justify banning, but that once speech morphs into behavior and conduct, then it can be banned. So if you look, for example, at the incitement to violence standards that the Supreme Court has promulgated, I'm allowed to go and give a speech in which I say, I think that murdering US government officials is justified because of all the violence that they impose on the world. I'm allowed to say that you can't prosecute me for that even though I'm explicitly advocating violence. That's the Brandenburg case where a KKK leader gave a speech and threatened violence against political officials, was prosecuted under a terrorism statute, and the Supreme Court said, no, you can abstractly advocate violence within the parameters of the First Amendment. What you can't do, though, is take a mob and go out somebody, outside of somebody's house and say, it's time to burn down that person's house, because then you're not just abstractly advocating violence, you're engaged in menacing conduct where you're imminently going to cause violence to take place to somebody else. So to me, that's the broad standard that ought to govern the rules that we feel comfortable with, which is there are no political ideas that are too pernicious, threatening, obnoxious, offensive, extreme, 
that ought to be banned because we don't trust people, certainly not tech executives, to make lists of what are good and bad political ideas. But we can draw a line and say, but there's a big difference between that and actual conduct, specifically harassing somebody, um, personally threatening them, the kind of digital equivalent of standing outside their house and urging a mob to bomb down their home. And although that line may be a little bit blurry in some cases, I think that's a workable framework where we're protecting ideas, um, but restricting conduct. And that seems to be workable in a constitutional sense. And I think it can also be workable on these you know, huge social media platforms as well. So I totally agree. And, and my point is that I think that when I look at these policies, I'm seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing a bar on incitement to violence. I'm seeing things that approximate an imminent harm standard. I'm seeing that you're, not, you're allowed to you know, say what you want, but you can't put a literal target on somebody's face, for instance, and, you know, or dox them, you know, reveal what they're, where they live, um, basically enable people to harm people physically. And when I actually looked at the policies, I was kind of heartened because I was like, oh, this is something I can work with. Let, let me just say, add one thing to that, which is I also think it's really important to draw a difference between public figures and private individuals as well. Um, so, you know, there are entire accounts that sign on to the Internet every day in order to just um, obsessively analyze my timeline and then just spend all day attacking me with ads and encouraging other people to do it. And I think they ought to be allowed to do that because I have a public platform and I've chosen to use that public platform in a way to try and influence public policy. Um, and I think that's true of all people with a public platform. I think though, if it's somebody who doesn't have a public platform and isn't a public figure, who's being targeted with that level of harassment, um, then it becomes something much different. And that too is something the law recognizes. We have different standards for what you can say about public figures in defamation context than you can about private citizens as well. I think that, as Brianna said earlier, whatever rules we have, we just need to err on the side, err on the side of making sure that we're not suppressing or banning people because of our distaste for their political outlook. Yeah, that's, that's I think, is my critical concern. One last point that I want to ask uh, the both of you before we close out is whether or not, kind of on a strategic level, it's a mistake simply to limit Jones because he's going to find uh, another way to get his, his message out. He's not, in fact, banned from the internet. His um, app or what have you that he started um, after he was sh um, shut off skyrocketed, uh, skyrocketed to number four place on iTunes. You know, there's this argument that the sunlight is the best disinfectant. And we have a lot of conversations about how politics are, are increasingly balkanized, and we don't know what each other think or believe or do. And I can't I personally can't see that um, excluding certain figures in mainstream social platforms is going to do anything constructive there. I don't think that Alex Jones has or has ever had a genuine interest in any kind of discourse. He sells brain pills that don't do anything. He makes up imaginary stories to scare people who want to be scared and to misinform people who are hungry for that. I don't think that he tries to be a, 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 an, an activist even. I don't think he tries to be a journalist. I think it's a big disservice uh, for people on the left to even bring up uh, BDS or Black Lives, Matters, Black Lives Matter in the same breath as Alex but Jones. But there are people who like him who do feel like these things are equivalent. And whatever our specific kind of personal and political judgments are, the reality is that by banning him, it feeds into their perception that he is being persecuted and, and validates a lot of his kooky conspiracy theories um, in their minds. And so as a strategic matter, do we think that's something that we should consider? Should we allow, for all the reasons that we discussed also, but should we also not want to exclude these folks because we're basically enabling them um, by giving, um, um, like by basically bolstering their claims that they're, they're being targeted unfairly. I see what you mean. Right. I mean, of course, Jones is now going to exploit this as, look, I said that I was a targeted, persecuted individual all along. Here's the proof, right? Here's my final word on this, I promise. Uh, I think that framing this or, or focusing too much on the terms of use plays right into Facebook's power. Because then the entire context for this argument is, within Facebook world, right? Mm -hmm. I think that it's a mistake to get hung up on whether Facebook's 
uh, principles or whatever you're gonna call them, terms of service are gonna be applied equitably because we know they're not. They never have been. It's too big of a comp it's too small of a company to govern two billion people. It's too big of a company in many ways. I, I think that plays into Facebook's uh, 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 ambitions of being, you know, this global arbiter of information and and truth. Um, I think Facebook would love to replace the internet. Uh, you know, pra in a practical uh, way. They would love to subsume email, I mean they already have in a lot of ways, email, websites, the whole thing. So to really just get hung up on whether Facebook's rules are right or wrong, I think ducks the question of like, and I know I've been saying this uh, over and over again now, of whether Facebook should be in a position to set those rules for so many people to begin with. It is highly disturbing to have a company in a position to set rules for how two billion people can communicate and disseminate information. So what do you, what is your, if you have one, your, your solution to the fact that we do have a company that now sets rules for how two billion people communicate, how do you wanna change that to prevent that from being the reality? I think that literally the only way out of this situation is breaking Facebook up and Google too. Okay, so what do you what do you think, Lynn? Acknowledging that that's not going to happen tomorrow, I'll give you the last word. So, short of these more drastic measures that I think we all like would like to see, and I think it's interesting. There's starting to be some right wing support for some of these measures as well, treating giants like the antitrust violators that they are. Short of that, which is a little bit longer term, I think the safest way, recognizing the dangers that it has, is to stop demanding that tech companies censor and protect us from bad people and bad ideas and instead demand that they provide us with the tools to protect ourselves personally, mute blocks, um, maybe algorithms um, and the like, maybe independent face check, fact checking organizations that are trustworthy and that have trans ideological credibility that can put ratings on them or something. Um, things like that, that at least protect the public to the extent possible while preserving these platforms as a free flowing um, stream of ideas that I think is in everybody's interest to have. So thank you both. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Happy to be here. And I hope to do it again. <laughs> thank you for having me. Let's do it again. <laughs>